Hi. Hi. This is the Carmudgeon Show. Is it? It is. It is. According to the television. Oh, we can fix that. Uh, how will I know what your name is? Oh, uh, my name is Jason hyphen Camisa. My name is Derek Tam no hyphen Scott. I don't, I don't know. I, I, who can say? You it's difficult put your to license read. out. I don't know. Um, we are a part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. And As is our show, the Carmudgeon Show, the one you are currently watching. Yes. This episode exists. That's about all I can say about it. Oh, come on. We're about to talk about Fred Astine tires, which have been winning a lot of comparison tests on Tire Rack, and I have them on my car, and we'll talk about that. And then we're going to read a whole bunch of funny shit stuff on online and talk about how you can best... Oh, there was a fa- fairly interesting, maybe, conversation about uh, how to navigate shitting on someone's dreams carefully carefully shitting carefully <laughs> <laughs> on someone's is that being dreams precise? is that focus and shitting or is that just you know like a strategic a i don't strategic know this is getting shitting. yeah this exactly. is getting uh if graphic. you like strategic <laughs> shitting you may consider driving <laughs> <laughs> driving the haggerty podcast network right off a cliff <laughs> <laughs> right off a cliff. Uh, yeah, this is one of those episodes. Uh, you might consider joining the Haggerty <laughs> Drivers Club, <laughs> which includes unlimited flatbed towing for all of your classic cars, unlimited access to our valuation tools, special events and VIP stuff, and also a fourth item. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just going to say we should get gummies and just be really fun. We don't up. need them. Yeah. I, that's we clearly the don't need yeah. them. <clears throat> well, yes. Enjoy. Psst. What? We're rolling. Oh. <laughs> Over what? Over whom? Um, Peasants? Ingrates? Left lane campers? Ah, I'm fine with left lane campers. The rest of it seemed a little bit... Uh, Maybe a classist. Um, So I just had a meeting this morning with a new insurance agent who knows me from sort of outside of uh, insurance. And I'm like, hey, what are we insuring? Cars, cars and like houses. Like this is not a Haggerty thing. This is these are non-collector cars cars, as in like e-golfs and uh, and, you know, houses and stuff like this. And he was like, uh, so why do you want to switch from your current agent to me? And I'm like, yeah, just a bunch of reasons. And he was like, well, I have no doubt you'll tell him exactly how you feel. <laughs> and I resented that. And I mean, I have Did resented you? That. I, I, I do. So I told that motherfucker. No, I, I think there's definitely, you know this about me, and I don't know if the audience knows, but there's definitely a cultural divide between East Coast and West Coast mentalities. Like other random story. I went with a bunch of friends, took a look at a rental apartment in San Francisco three days ago. And the agent said three words. And I just went, Queens. And she was like, what? I'm like, you're from Queens. And she was like, how did you know? And how I knew wasn't, it wasn't just the New York accent. First of all, she had a little bit of an accent, but it was her demeanor was immediately, uh, immediately New York. But the way there was one word she pronounced and I'm like, "Mm, yeah, it's definitely not Brooklyn. It's Queens. Um, And she was like, I've been gone for 20 years, whatever, you know, and there's just an immediate difference in culture between east coast and west coast so this insurance agent pissed me off but he's not wrong i do tend to tell people what they what they think however what you think what i think what they should think i should say because <laughs> i'm always fucking right no i i find this east coast west coast, coast divide very interesting and it plays a, uh, up a lot in my social life i have my east coast friends who i can treat one way and then west coast friends you you're a bunch of gentle fucking soft people i have to be nice to and be like i think that's great um what's funny is that i have historically in sort of corporate environments consistently received feedback about my directness (laughs) your directness is very different i think than that's true directness that's true 
if you're not paying attention to what I'm saying, then you will miss the directness exactly. and you will f- assume that it is something benign. Right. But if you actually listen to and interpret what I'm saying, then you'll be like, oh, wow. You will cut a bitch <laughs> with words. Yes. Yeah, your your directness is very much a British sort of way, yeah, right? The Brits, fair. like I've just, I have a friend of mine who's uh, having some issues at work and uh, he's like incredibly softly spoken and incredibly like n- one of the most nurturing sort of career advicey people I've ever met. And uh, we heard some musings that that somebody thought he was too direct. And I'm like, wait a second. Like, you give people hugs all day. And I'm like, this is really great. And I think you're wonderful. And, like, I think you're everything that everyone would ever want. But maybe if we could do, like, I hear him, like, do that kind of shit. Like, maybe. And I'm like, what do you you mean you're too direct? And I realize he's not from America. And the sort of level, the way that Brits, for example, communicate with people Mm -hmm. is horrifying. So, like... In high school in Germany, which was an international location, all of the British teachers had the American students crying all the time. And all of the American teachers had the British kids crying. But like, I could have an American teacher screaming at me, like, come here, what are you doing now? And I'm like, yeah, fine, yeah, I'm like, fine, I'm sorry. But the British teachers, oh my God, I will not tolerate this. Bl-. And they get this like tone of voice and you're like, <gasps> Oh my god! Like I'm in actual trouble, and like all the American kids were like freeze with the British teachers, and then all the British kids would be in tears, like I can't believe they've spoken to me that way, and blah blah blah. You know, it was just so unbelievably different. Divergent. So I live this world of like East Coast West Coast cultural differences, and I don't care how long I'm in the West Coast, I will never be nice. Um, but I also don't think people realize is a large part of my job my career that I have to measure out what I say. I can't say what I really think. And that's for a number of reasons. In print. (laughs) We say a lot of stuff on this show that we probably shouldn't. But no, I mean, in in print, in writing, right? So I'm reviewing Anything that's going to exist in perpetuity. It's not even that. It's that the people, I have to remember, first of all, that the people who poured their heart and souls into cars are reading what I wrote about them. And if I take a really harsh, cheap shot, I'm going to hurt them. And I don't, as much as I love the idea of running over left lane Priuses and Subarus, I don't actually want to hurt people. And I especially understand that companies all have their own dynamics and individual contributors can pour their heart out into something that can be terrible. (coughs) Chrysler. So, you know, we've had, that was a cheap shot. So you're supposed to smile and laugh and you didn't because you're mean. But I've I've had Chrysler. I was like, eh, that checks out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've had Chrysler PR people crying on the phone with me. Like, why are you so mean to us? And I'm like, I thought I was being nice. Like, whoops. Um, but the, you know, my response to that is somebody, it's okay. Somebody's got to be last. Somebody's always going to be first. Somebody's always going to be last. And everyone's going to be somewhere in the middle. Just because you finished dead last in this comparison test with a 40 point mar- margin to the next worst car doesn't mean you're a bad person or doesn't mean that the people involved in this are failures of human beings, but or weren't even, or we're not or, trying, we're trying, right? All of that. But sometimes things just conspire against you. And so there are plenty of times where I, in my course of business, genuinely have to so- have to soften the blow. Um, including, answering to editors in chief, you know, Gene Jennings from automobile was just, there will be no cheap shots, Jason. Like, you know, you make a joke that would make me laugh. Like, cause it's so offensively rude. Um, but it wasn't going to wind up in print because she would get a phone call from somebody saying, fuck you. Like, that's not cool. Um, and so how do you, let's just start with the definition. How do you define cheap shot? A matter of a, first of all, an insult or a matter of opinion. That's not based in fact. And so, like, I'll watch a lot of our competitors in term, in the content creation space, and they'll be saying, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. And it's because they don't like it. And frankly, they don't matter. Like, it doesn't matter. Sorry, I'll use the Throttle House guys as, as, a, as an example because I'm friends with them. Like, if Thomas was like, well, I don't like this shifter. Well, fuck you, Thomas. You don't, you don't decide what's a good shifter and what's a bad shifter. What... And I'm not saying he's ever done this for the record, Thomas, don't kill me. Um, You know, but as a journalist, your job is to understand what the intention was and then understand what the customer's expectation are is. And if those things align, you're giving that car a good review, period. 
Right? You can say this is not for enthusiasts, but to say well, and that's why you have to be more specific. You would use words like precise or rubbery or notchy to be descriptive, as exactly. opposed to saying good or bad. Good right. or bad is it's a, a value judgment, and it's also vague. It's cheap, right? Yeah. It's cheap. It's I uh, you you well, suck. It's, it's, well, how about ba- like how wh- how well? <laughs> Well, yes, if you're talking about a Dyson review, in all seriousness, right? I mean, then you'd have the measure of suction. suction. (laughs) Um, But uh, yeah, you don't want to say something's good or bad. You can describe it and you can say, for example, you know, a cheap shot would be this BMW shifter sucks in the M2, right? BMW's PR people got really pissed off at everyone saying the shifter in the current M2 sucks. And their point is it's the same shifter that they've used for 400 years. Okay, you can, you can't, they can come back and say, that doesn't suck. What they can't come back and saying is, when you compare this to the shifters that have come out of Honda, Mazda, and Porsche over the last 20 years, the, the rest of the industry has had an arc and a transition into shifters that feel like X, Y, and Z, and BMW hasn't. In fact, if anything, BMW's gone the other way, and therefore, this stands out and perhaps doesn't meet customer expectations. Very different thing than saying the shifter sucks. It doesn't. It sucks in comparison to the other stuff, right? And so context is important and whatever. And there's a lot of measure that has to go into this stuff. Um, I have, I don't think I've ever reviewed a car where I've said to the car company, you don't want to hear what, I happened once a couple years ago. Actually, I don't remember what it was where I'm like, I'm just not going to say anything because I had a really bad experience with a press car that just. Everyone wants to know what it is. I'm not going to say. You don't remember. I don't recall, but there are, there are other things, for example, tires, right? So we just, we just had a fun experience on the way back from lunch. It's raining cats and dogs. And I have Fredestein Quattrack tires on the Eagle. Installed Installed. for the winter. For the winter. So I have Pilot Sport 4S as background. I put 18 inch Pilot Sport 4S's in the GTI size on my Eagle and lost 19% of my range immediately. Um, and it's now winter, which means it's raining a lot here in the Bay Area. And by that, I mean, we have atmospheric rivers and pineapple expresses and all kinds of other stupid, uh, cheaply worded things um, to describe like, you know, five, six inches of rain over the course of two or three days over and over and over again. Um, and my PS- I mean, I'm sure a meteorologist would be able to describe to you exactly what those things are. They are, but they're stupid fucking marketing names. I'm sorry to say. Just say it's raining. We have a lot of rain. Water is falling from the sky. It's a phenomenon. It's a thing. It happens. It originated from Hawaii. Pineapple Express. Yeah. Why not like Lay Express? I would like an Express Lay. <laughs> um, but, okay. So uh, it's raining a lot. I, a busy professional. I get it. <laughs> my uh, Pilot Sport 4S's, which are, as far as I'm concerned, the best performance tires on the planet and i've driven everything else so i can say that with a degree of certainty uh, are down to two thirty seconds of tread so not much um and they have three nails in them because of the incons- invertebrates yes in- inconsiderate invertebrate boobs who also occupy the parking lot that we record this uh, podcast in who just love to throw nails all over the ground because they're construction invertebrates. Um, and so I thought, all right, I'm not going to replace the tires right now, right before rainy season. And in fact, I would like to get some of the range back because in the winter you use a lot more battery for just a inefficiencies in the, in the EV system, heat wipers, lights, and then rain. seated heats, seated heats. And, uh, so I reached out to Fredestein and asked for a recommendation and they sent me a set of Quattrax if I agreed to review them. Oh my God, they're so good. So first of all, the e-golf looks like shit with the 16 inch wheels on it again, which irritates me. However, I don't understand this about this car. I went from 16s to 18s and now back to 16s and there's been no change in ride quality whatsoever. Like Volkswagen has done magic on that. Um, and I got, I've gotten like about 20% of range back, which is obscene. Well, um, Rolling resistance, man. Yeah. It's Do you use, so those tires are specifically engineered to be low rolling resistance. They're actually not ish. They're but they achieve that so level of rolling resistance the, that qualifies them. They're grade C hmm. out of E. So A B C D E so and mid, they're C mid pack. Mid pack. Um, the I think they're the So is it wheel aerodynamics? 
It's both. Is but the frontal probably. area, the, the width of the tire, the no, same? No, they're different. They, I went from 205 to 225s. Mm-hmm. It's mostly the compound. Um, but these do well. They're doing great. But the crazy thing is they grip like motherfuckers. Like they grip like mother. You experience this. Yes. So it's raining. Yes. And? The car grips in, in wet certainly very well. But both ends, but I would say the front end more than the back. <laughs> so then I have that 034 Motorsport sway bar on the back. So now with a slightly reduced level of grip versus the Pilot Sports, uh, the rear bar, the rear anti-roll bar is doing far more. <laughs> and so this thing is quite assy. Out. Yeah. It's hilarious yeah. for an electric front wheel drive yeah. hot hatch. Um, Very which entertaining. Is not hot at all. It's a cold hatch. It's yeah. a cold and wet, damp hatch. Yes. Um but uh, this is great. I mean, I love the idea that they gave me a set of tires and I'm like, wow, okay, there's some weird things. They make some weird resonant noises. They're actually louder than the PS4S is at very low speeds, um, which I find very strange. And they have a little bit of a wah, 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 wah sound to them at different speeds, which usually you think of as broken bands, but they did this immediately when they started. Um, however, they grip like the Dickens. And I really get, I like and that. And good I get and give, cold and moist yeah. and... Uh, yeah, I mean, Efficiency. I just had a friend in his Model Y performance on whatever the sticky summers. Uh, and it was like, you know, a 65 degree sunny dry day and he couldn't even come close to keeping up with me running on ramp. Um, I mean, that could be operator error. No, he, he drives like a lunatic. Oh, Anyways, really? Yeah, no, they generate a ton of grip. It's over a G, I'm sure. I mean, I could go. Find the, a 300 foot, foot, foot circle. The ass. I do it around traffic circles and. Closed roads. We don't have traffic circles here. There's one right on the street. I was trying to give you an out. It's on private property and how dare you. It's at Sonoma Raceway right up the street. That's where there I that's go. where I did test the last one when the when the PS4S has pulled 1.07, which was just stupid amounts of grip. Anyway, um, there actually a lot goes into a bad review. Oh dear, we have lost our the car Carmudgeon logo. show. Oh no! Um, well, how will we know where we are and what we are doing? We we could screen? actually we could turn on Samsung TV Plus to channel eleven ninety two four four eleven ninety four, which is the Haggerty channel. Um, we are checking device power. It has power uh, because <laughs> the Carmudgeon Show and all of uh, Haggerty's other YouTube stuff is on channel eleven ninety four. We should. On your Samsung Samsung. devices. Oh, your Samsung device, which always fucking wants to detect a device. Nosy bastard. Anyway, so my question to you is, in your world, how do you soften blows when you need to give... (laughs) I'm going to rephrase that. (laughs) Get a fluffer. (laughs) That's not softening. That's hardening a blow. Oh, right. Um, Sorry. So you have a customer who wants a car. Fire your current fluffer because they're not working. (laughs) (laughs) Customer wants a certain car and they're either looking at a specific car or that whatever they want doesn't meet their needs or just sucks. What do you do? Uh, I take, I'm pretty direct generally. I also, but I do try to be super conscious of the thing that you just mentioned, which is to understand that their objectives may be different from mine. In fact, invariably, they are different. And it's interesting to go look at various car collections because you can sort of see that person's manifest. It's a manifestation of their personality, of their priorities, of their philosophy around cars. And the majority of collections that I see, I will look at it and I'll be like, that is an impressive assemblage of automobiles. But I won't leave with this sense of like, man, that guy's fucking cool. And mm-hmm. sometimes you see like a collection that someone has put together and you talk to them about why they have this, this and that and that. And you're like, wow, what an absolute hero. I just admire you immensely and I like you and you just understand intrinsically what coolness is. It's mm-hmm. like if you were to meet Steve McQueen, you're just like, that's cool. Some people are sort of, they're almost like memes incarnate. A collection can be memes incarnate. They're just like, I see that you, you know, visited the Porsche dealer repeatedly or, you know, whatever the thing is that the, the statement that it could be about the, have you been to Jay Leno's garage? I've not. Huh? That's an interesting one because so uh, I should have plugged this when it happened actually. So back in October, I drove to Scirocco down to Jay Leno's uh, garage and did a, a, a YouTube episode of his show and that place is wild because he is the the guy who you're like you get this yes there's a lot of shit that i don't have any interest in that Mm -hmm. he collects motorcycles for example or one big genre but i mean he's got a show gun yeah like he's got a mclaren f1 and a show gun yeah yeah like okay you get it yes you're into this for the right reasons yes and some people 
I mean, you, you, they are, like I, I use the term large child, which is that you, you buy the things that you wanted as a teenager and it's done on a pretty instinctive sort of, not in a sort of considered, carefully thought out way that is a representation of thousands of hours spent considering all this stuff. You sort of just Want. pulled the trigger and started buying things indiscriminately. Uh, and I really respect and admire when I see a collection that is so thoughtful and that, you know, is a little has personality, has some eccentricness, you know. When you see that it is like, okay, there's a Lamborghini Diablo and there's an F forty and there's a Countach and there's a it's just like all the sort of poster cars, mm-hmm. but there's none of this sort of like I drove this car across this country and decided it was or wasn't for me and sort of this this experience that you get just from spending an a day at speed, kind of just hustling a car, and you can suddenly realize that you do or don't want this thing that you thought you did. And I respect when people have gone through the trouble to sort of do that. So my question when in that circumstance is, you know, who are you? What do you want? What do you what do you what makes you happy? Tell me cars that you've enjoyed. It's basically playing, you know, psychologist mm-hmm. or psychiatrist in some cases. <laughs> um if you need a prescription drug, yeah. for this this car. This is a this is weapons grade. You need a prescription for this. Now, if only we could keep the, the yeah. weapons grade stuff out of the And also yeah. distribute cars in accordance with meritocracy because there is also this issue where the people who deserve the cars, who know all the stuff about them be, because they're such a high barrier of entry because things are expensive, you know, are not always the people who end up with them. Sometimes they end up with people who are just like, I was told these are cool, so I bought one. And, you know, that's And then subsequently destroyed it. Perhaps, yeah. yeah. It's it's disappointing when mm-hmm. that happens. So I guess what I try to do is frame things in terms of uh, p- putting myself in their shoes. Who are you? What makes you happy? You know, what I think, like you say, is irrelevant. And mm-hmm. I remove myself from that unless I've identified a person who is who is cut from the same cloth right. as me. And once you figure out whether that person sort of resonates with you and you, or, or that person resonates, whatever, it's immaterial is your perspective. Um, whether you're on the same page and they're like, this person gets it. Their priorities, you know, I had a client who I was concerned. He bought a, you know, Porsche GT2. And I said, okay, you looked at the spec sheet and you said, this is the one I want because it's got all these horsepower. And he took it and did a track day in it. And he said, you know, I think I actually want a GT3 instead mm-hmm. of this, a 997 GT3 specifically. Mm-hmm. Like I had this experience. I, I took it on track. I, I did this with it. And I said, I, I think I'm actually have decided this. And I was like, wow, it's impressive. He doesn't have that many cars. He hasn't been doing it that long. And he very rapidly arrived got at a place right <laughs> that people <laughs> will not, you know, some of these people will go decades without ever reaching that. Mm-hmm. point and so i was like i really respect that that, that mm-hmm. this person did that and so then you identify that this person is on the same page as you and then you you speak candidly you mm-hmm. say based on what i know about you i think this or that is a really good fit you know or that car and then you can sort of then i can start actually saying what i think i think that's a wanker car or whatever um you know so it kind of just depends if it's that type of person it's a different conversation than other people who are just sort of like eh, does that make you happy is that what you want you know and you sort of play along you say that's an incredible configuration or like yeah i mean it's fast as shit and you know the the subtext for me or in my head is like i don't care about that but if, right. if for them do, if from yeah. in their perspective that's a compliment and they're like yeah it is and it's like okay cool i mean that's what's important to you so you just have to sort of read the room and figure out their priorities and have, speak in those terms. Have you ever gotten yourself like it tripped up in trouble by being too honest? Like, oh, why would you ever buy what was it? Oh, 25th anniversary Quintage. A 25th anniversary Quintage, those are fucking terrible. And be like, well, actually, I own three of them right uh, back from, from the potential customer that you. I, when I say that, no, I, I, tr- I try to frame th- or phrase things in a way that makes it clear that it's my opinion. I just say I, that that aesthetic to me doesn't do much. And, and usually they'll be just like, I love it, I think, because I had it on my wall or whatever. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're receptive to that. They understand that it's subjective and that it's controversial and they're not like going to be super hurt about mm-hmm. it generally. And I try to be open-minded to th- and very transparent about things I do and don't have experience with. Uh, and if they do, then I want to learn from them. I mean, I guess it's the it's same thing as giving a car review, right? It doesn't matter. Well, and if someone is giving me a car for a video, then I have to sort of, you know, they have gone out of their way to hand me something that is expensive and valuable, and I have to sort of approach it and articulate it in a certain way. And so um, you, I know, have detected this from from my scripts, but I will, I will sort of, I don't know, toe the line or figure out what is good about it or or describe what the car is good at 
and what it's appropriate for or how it makes you feel. You know, there's always something interesting to say about some car, you know? Almost always, yeah. Not always. Yeah, I, yeah, I won't, I think I don't make content about a car that doesn't right. have some avenue that I can mm -hmm. take to say something favorable. You know, like that V550 Aston Martin, I didn't particularly care for the way that it drove, mm -hmm. uh, but it does other things. You know, mm -hmm. you can talk about craftsmanship, you can talk about straight line performance, you can talk about, you know, like to me, the car felt like a, a 1960s resto mod. Uh, that had been made in the 90s, you know, which, if you frame it correctly, is actually sort of charming. That's right, right interesting. Yeah. It's, and it certainly is interesting, and it's not like anything else that was built in that period. And, you know, I went into that episode idolizing that car and then being like, man, why are these things worth so little money when Lamborghini Diablos are worth two or three times as much and F50s are worth 10 times as much? Mm. And then after I, you know, drove it, I was like, hmm, interesting, okay. Mm. I kind of see it, <laughs> but you know, I'm not going to put that in the video. I'm just going to say that, you know, this thing is brutish. It's an absolutely wild animal and it has so much torque and there's always some angle to take where you can find a silver lining in my I, the, I, in experience. I'm going to say probably one out of every four or five revelation script I write, there's a point at which I want to kill the episode. <laughs> like I just either... The reviews are so bad or the whole backstory is such a pain in the ass or the whole thing will be difficult enough that I don't want to be the guy to have to say it. Mm -hmm. Like it's a pain. It's a it's a genuine it's an art. Some, yeah, I guess. I mean, but the thing is, at the end of the day, I want to be able to give a bad review of a car, right? I, I want to be able to say this isn't what it should be. Um, and I'm not paid directly by any of those people. So there's a benefit there. Like I have a layer of separation. You can say to a customer, like, you know, you could be in trying to broker a deal, say something bad about the car and you've lost that sale. So you're incentivized to make it go through, which means you're incentivized to put people in the cars that they really want, right? Well, there's um, a difference between the car, like all, you know, NSXs are bad. Mm -hmm. Or, Which is true. Yes, I know. That's why I chose that example uh, from your perspective. Um, you know, there's a difference between all NSXs are bad versus this NSX is bad. Right. To some extent, that that person doesn't care whether the NSX is good. They want one, you know, right. or whether I think it's good or not. Mm -hmm. They want one. It, the place where it is important is for me to be like, well, you know, this one hit a wall backwards at 90 miles an hour, so it's a bad one, so I wouldn't buy this one. You know, that's an easy conversation to have. Yeah. And people are super appreciative when you your expertise. I mean, like I, with some regularity, fly somewhere and turn up at some car dealer and look at a car closely and have to report back to some person who's paying me to be there. You know, is it a good one or not? Well, you know, aside from the part where there's a weld under the floor pan that goes the entire width of the car because hmm. they put a new back of it on, yeah. you know, it's not bad. Or, you know, these replicas are made in, the, these replica wheels were made in China. They're not real. You know, mm. you have the guy buy you a set of real ones and I just saved you five grand, which mm. more than covers the cost of my being there or, you know, but you have to be, that. that's the part where it's super easy to just be like, that's a bad one, Yeah. you know? Sometimes I, I have to tell people that when I'm selling their cars, like, I'm sorry you own a bad car. Say. Right. And uh, we have to be transparent about that because I... Have How do you do that? How do you say, I'm sorry you own a bad car? Uh, do you, or do you skirt around it? No, no, no. You, you send them a, a detailed list with photos of why that's the case. And you don't say it's a bad car. You right, just say, exactly. here are its shortcomings, you know, mm -hmm. that materially affect its value and right. saleability, uh, you know we'll have to figure out a way to get through this and it's going to have to be transparently. <laughs> yeah. That's, I, I find if it's stuff that you can back up, I'm sorry, when I, when I'm doing something negative, I just always fall back on the stuff that Let I can. Let the data and the sort of themselves. unarguable yeah. sort of um, objectively true unassailable things. Right. Do the talking. talking. You don't have to say it's bad. You give them enough data, they 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 get there on their own. <laughs> right. That's it. That's, it's a difficult dance to do. Yeah. Um, it is. This whole thing came up because of two things. We were talking about, in a previous episode, you mentioned you want to do an episode on John Phillips. Mm -hmm. uh, or at least driver, start uh, sharing his quotes. Yeah, because some of them were hilarious. And I was then, I've been doing research on Bugatti EB110. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason. For some reason that has a reason. And uh, that's a tough one. It's a tough one. So we'll get, we'll, we'll cover that car later. But there's a lot of bad press about that car and a lot of like amazing press. And mm, so polarizing. I, uh, I'm not sure whether it's polarizing or it was just two different perspectives or it's who fell for, there was a, 
So, so the EB110 was the resurrection of the of the Bugatti brand back in 1987. Technically, it all started, and there are some amazing things that I dug up that I had no idea. People involved, like I don't know this guy. Uh, I can't remember his name. Ferruccio, Ferruccio, Fer, Lamborghini, something like that. He was actually involved in the rebirth of the EB110. Very. He was the sort of spark that created it. I had no idea, mm. right? He then wasn't involved in the actual car, but the idea was sort of his spark. Um, and so there are like amazing, all these like amazing characters who just keep appearing in all of these Revelations episodes that I'm doing. Like the guy that, you haven't seen it yet, but there's another Revelations, sorry. There's a thing I did on a Lamborghini LMO2. There's revelations on Lamborghini LMO2 coming out. And the guy who brought the LMO, the LM project to Lamborghini um, is the guy who eventually then put uh, Ferruccio Lamborghini in touch with Romano Arcioli to make the EB110. Mm. And then all the engineers in the EB110 were old Lamborghini engineers like Paolo Stanzani. And the, it's uh, the entire same cast of characters who it's-, it's Who created uh, the Mira uh, and the Kutosh. Exactly. They were the same guys- from Marcello Gandini in the styling department. It's the same cast of lunatics. Um, and I love that. But there's also, there was a lot of doubt on where the money came for financing on this car, for example. And some people were like, this is great. The, you know, the Bugatti has a patron. And the other people were pointing out like, this is fucked up. Like, we don't trust this. We don't think it's going to work. Um, and so the car itself wasn't even relevant it, it, to the polarizing nature of the whole story. It was, the, those who were like, "Yeah, I'm excited that this is happening," and the other one, so we're like, "We don't under, we don't trust who's behind this." Um, and so, in doing research, I I I reread a whole bunch of stories that I'd read years ago about the launch of this car, and it was this. I'll go into it in the video, but like this over the top, ridiculously lavish r resource. Bend. Mm. I don't want to call it a waste of resources, but it was. It had to have cost capital intensive. Capital intensive of experience <laughs> that had to have cost tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars to pull off, and the sort of fanfare around it in the Bugatti uh, community is like, "Oh my God, look at this!" And then I dug up Robert Cumberford's piece in an automobile magazine, which I don't think is online, and I should just find a way to post it. Um, but he was there and he was like, yeah, it was an entire two day experience. And yeah, it was this, but let's talk about this. They, because they're French and Italian, they're completely disorganized and they all hate each other. And I'm paraphrasing. Uh, and, uh, so all, they did give a whole day of speeches that were interminable and boring and also all in fucking French because France. And he just <laughs> hilarious he just ripped this event to shreds now most people are like was this a review for the car <laughs> this is a review of the event he reviewed so the, event. the event why was the so event even deserving because of a because it was so catastrophically was so bad that he mad. just vented right. in a magazine and robert cumberford lives he's, he's nine, now 90 or 91 years old he lives in france is married to a french woman and he sort of has a very french sort of complaint nature about him yes and so where everyone else is like wow there were six thousand people at this reveal and they basically closed down half of paris and they did this and they did that and they did this and it was unbelievable and it was like lush and whatever and he's like it was all in french Artioli couldn't fucking speak french so he had some guy helping him through how to pronounce the friggin' words there was no interpreters you know every, everything should have been in english what the fuck are they doing the food was late and then they tried to drive this car across paris but of course they had 50 cops and they couldn't fucking pull their heads out of their asses and so it was a traffic clusterfuck with motorcycles hitting taxi cabs trying to avoid the eb110 prototype and blah blah, blah. i mean it was just amazing um which brought me back to Phillips because Phillips uses comedy as a, as a writer in a way to say terrible shit um, that no one else would get away with. I think you do that too. I try. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much it works. Um, but more importantly, John Phillips did post a, he made a column of all the things he once said and shouldn't have. Um, and he called or didn't say right or didn't say he said a whole bunch of what not to write um so he said don't write for example the renola car is guaranteed to end your social life that was the right one of the quotes <laughs> so um uh so like this it's a column right in the beginning of it a body that resembles janice joplin janice joplin's during her most devoted heroin years <laughs> i mean <laughs> So 
<laughs> oh, what, what, what car is that? That was all the point. Uh, I don't know. We're going to find out. So anyway, oh. so I saw that headline and I started going down and Phillips did a column and he decided to list all of the things that he once said and shouldn't have or said and redacted from his columns before they made, before it, to they print. made it to print. Yeah. And I just, I read like one or two of these, laughed myself, like laughed out loud. And I'm like, stop, I'm not doing this. We're going to read these okay. in celebration of John Phillips before we do a Phillips episode. Um, I mean, this could be the Phillips episode. It could be. Um, and he said he actually quoted Larry Griffin, who was a car driver contributor, once referred to as a commercial airliner as a pus packed knockwurst of the sky. <laughs> and I just, why, why is that even in a car magazine? I mean, the, the best part about being insane and let me be very clear john is insane and he i will probably hear from him and or his lawyers for saying that um is that you come up with the craziest fucking shit um so uh i will introduce you to the chevrolet ssr ah uh, yes uh phillips wrote and by the way this is on car driver's website we'll put a link in the description uh some look at things that are and ask why i dream of things that never were and ask why this? <laughs> like, and it, good point. Why the fuck do you need a convertible two seat pickup truck with like, you know, retro style retro yeah. that doesn't tow anything. And I love that. Like to, to our point about towing the line and just trying to whatever, it would be a cheap shot to say, what the, f I don't know. What the fuck is this thing? It looks like a X, Y, whatever, the, you know, looks like a suppository with a retractable roof. No, he went straight for the philosophical <laughs> of a Cadillac whose power steering pump burst during a comparison test. It was, oh, oh, it, oh, it was leaking fluids like a toddler who'd already endured 90 minutes of Schindler, Schindler's list. Oh my God. Why? So, <laughs> I don't know what that means. Is the kid crying? Is the kid pe peeing himself? I'm not sure we should know. Is he talking? He's talking about the film, I guess. It's black and uh, black and white and yes. dull to toddlers. And right, but are they crying? Leaking fluids? Like the kid's crying? I, I'm or it's or I've been unable to excuse itself. I mean, so, so it's yeah. unclear. So it's that was unclear. just this, this was too vague. That was. I'm gonna give that one a D. Because, you know, the first rule of comedy is you have to be perfectly clear. Of a BMW 3 Series shifter, as slick as the jump, jumpsuits worn by Captain and Tennille. Come on, you don't know who Captain Tennille were? Mm -mm. Oh, God, I'm going to have to sing. Do it to me one more time. Okay, Once got it. Is never enough. Um, so yeah, it's like some I'm, kind of pleathered. It was a pleathery sort of jumpsuit. Okay. Of the, fine, forget it. I guess you don't know. This. You're not old enough. Yes. Of the Pontiac Aztec, a body that resembles Janis Joplin's during her most devoted heroin years. I see. I'm not sure I agree, but it's so funny <laughs> that it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's yeah, because don't you? I don't know much about the physiology of heroin, but people like you live in age San Francisco. And, there are heroin people. Are they? Is that heroin? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's certainly not a picture of health. No. No, and I, but the thing is, I tend to think of heroin people as sort of thick, rough skin and sort of very drawn and very, very, very thin. Um, yeah, and the, the Aztec is sort of corpulent. Yeah, so I'm not sure I, you know, agree with Wrong that. Wrong car, right phrase. Amazing phrase. Uh, of the Hummer H2, a pro professional tailgater's vehicle that can be driven strictly by feel and sound with road rage offered as standard equipment. I mean, I like checks the road out. rage as yeah. standard equipment, but that's everything you drive. Yeah. <laughs> that checks out. Of an Oldsmobile custom cruiser. It should have been called the Emet Emetic. Emetic. Uh, Emetic. What is an em Emetic? Uh, something that makes you vomit. <laughs> Anti-Emetic oh, like is a drug Ipecac. that you take. Yes. Yeah, Ipecac. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anti-Emetic is a drug that makes you not vomit. Okay. So it should have been or called the Emetic nature. because the body motions will induce the sort of vomiting necessary to save the lives of recently self-poisoned persons, <laughs> namely this vehicle's buyers on or around the date of their third payment. <laughs> it's the continuation. It's the like, it should have just been called the Emetic. We know what that means, right? As long as you know it's what a medic so means. so graphic. Right, exactly. It's like they endorse them who they've self-poisoned, namely those buyers, 
on or around the date of their third payment. I mean, he just kept so shitting specific. on it. Yeah, exactly, I love that. Of the Daewoo built Pontiac Le Mans, sufficiently awful that it will cause you to abandon your family and open a souvenir shop in T- Tukumkari. <laughs> that one's just absurd. Like yes. Of the Chrysler Concorde, whose front wheels intruded on the footwells, the dead pedal's position will suit those who have recently received a prosthetic leg, left leg made in Somalia. <laughs> yeah, that one's also nonsensical. What? Is there a, a Somalian problem with prosthetic left legs? Uh, of the Plymouth- I think he might be referring to the mine problem they had there. Oh, that's <laughs> mean. That's filthy. <laughs> uh, I, this was I, his early 90s? This well, I don't even know. Let me see if there's a date Mid-90s. on this. March 19th, 2010. Huh. But they could have been, I mean, half of these cars are late 90s, early 2000s. The thing that's weird to me is that there are so many Chryslers in here. <laughs> um, <laughs> this so, is just the shit on, secret shit on Chrysler episode. Yeah. You already talked about Chrysler PR people weeping. I know. And the Stellantis episode a couple episodes ago. About, uh, oh, somebody in the comments said they refer to uh, Stellantis as uh, Global Leyland. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. I thought it was really good. Yes. Um, of, <laughs> of the Plymouth Prowler's stiff ride. Great car if you enjoy viewing the passing landscape in moiré patterns. <laughs> <laughs> that was a funny one. Of the Chrysler Crossfire's similarly unyielding ride. Very much like an epileptic seizure, except you unfortunately remember every single detail afterwards. <laughs> That's so good, except you remember every (laughs) day. Of the Geo Metro convertible, all the structural integrity of Hollandaise sauce atop (laughs) filet of eel. (laughs) Why did that one not make it? It might have made it it too harsh. Oh, or is that so, are these some of his been, sickest burns? Or are they, well, is it clarified whether they said, made it on the right, where well, their cutting room floor? Or you know, I probably made? should have called him or emailed him and whatever. Um, blah, 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 blah. I've collected a few of my own excesses, either thrown back at me or voluntarily withdrawn in respect for that old Rodney Dangerfield line. You like ladies lingerie? Yeah, that's good because there's a pink slip on your desk. Um, I offer them here as kind of a what not to do template for Columbia Journalism Review. I, some of these, I mean, that one could have made it in. Hmm. I think that's quite good. I think it's quite funny. Yeah. Um, actually, the first letter, the only letter to the editor, first of two letters to the editor that I ever wrote to Car and Driver back in the day was uh, they had just hired a guy named, funny enough, Tony Quiroga, who is now the editor in chief. But he wrote a line of comparing the structural rigidity of the Pontiac, uh, uh, not the Pontiac, the um, Ford Thunder Chicken, the Thunderbird to the fox uh, one yeah no not the fox the lincoln ls one um, oh the retro sort of the retro styling one he oh, so ca- you were a full adult when this happened i beg your pardon well as opposed to writing a letter to the editor when you were a child i mean i was 20 something probably anyway but i remember he compared it he called it the katherine hepburn burn of convertibles because that structure was but and she had parkinson's and that was so oh. fucking not funny except <laughs> to everyone including me and I, I remember writing a letter to the to chuba the editor and like whoever this guy is give him a raise and they published the letter and tony still has it huh. he is now the editor-in-chief of car and driver <laughs> um all these years later and i remember him saying he's like, yeah i remember that i'm pretty sure he still has it but uh i that that is a cheap shot at not at the car at mrs hepburn mm-hmm. um all right where were we <laughs> we <laughs> hollandaise sauce hollandaise sauce uh on a top fillet of eel i mean is that a thing of an early porsche 911 turbo a particularly spirited drive in the hills will necessarily be bought, uh, followed by a week of prunes and quaker oats so he's saying a particularly spirited drive in the hills would be would result in constipation that doesn't make sense is it me. for pucker factor Oh, is it like maybe? You, yes. Okay. That one's a little bit. It's of a, unclear. Of a stretch. Yes. Not, it's actually not stretch. It's the opposite of stretch. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, unclear. Oh. Of a Renault Lacar, one of his first reviews, guaranteed to end your social life and lead to a lifetime of bedwetting interrupted only by savage bouts of window peeping. <laughs> <laughs> <What>? that's, that's, <laughs> that's like nonsensical. I mean, what he's saying is you're going to go insane. Uh, 
of an Alfa Romeo oh, spider. Oh, I see. Yeah, you're going to wind up being like, you know, a window licking, like, can you say window licker? Is that a thing? I've never heard it, but no? I... That was referred to the children who rode in the short bus and were licking the window for enjoyment. Oh, I see. That was a very offensive thing. Wow, I've never heard that one. You should hang out with our friend Mike more often. Mm. That's where I learned that one. Of an Alfa Romeo spider. With steering this sloppy, expect to crash minutes after departing the showroom. <laughs> Although the car will likely self-immolate or rust into fine red dust before it can truly maim you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of stuff that would get you. <laughs> These days, totally banned. I mean, you know, expect to crash. That's that's actually an accusation of like... <laughs> negligence. Negligence. Yeah. <laughs> what um, era was this i don't know of the uh, of an alfa romeo spider my guess would be the the last of the original the series three or series yeah. four, four 80s and 90s like of the first oldsmobile bravada i memorized the rollover warnings on the visor and performed every band maneuver in hopes of wadding this rebadged armadillo into a metallic pellet that could be re <laughs> readily gathered by a pooper scooper <laughs> I mean, it's just so specific. You, I think the specificity it, is it, really his comedy, right? Yeah. Like the the eel, like yeah. you know, not just atop a Jello mold. No, no, no. It's a really fillet specific. Of eel. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you remember ever seeing. He did a comparison test years and years and years ago, and I think it was. It might have been where this quote came from. Uh, I feel like it was maybe a bravada versus a. Um, uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee. No, it was, uh, this was in like 95, 96 when the first Explorer came out and it was like Explorer and Grand Cherokee were the two hot. Mm -hmm. Although I think there was an Oldsmobile in that one too. And he had worked with the photographer to make the entire photo theme, a bunch of Boy Scouts who were beating the shit out of each other. And I just remember belly laughing the entire way through that <laughs> review. Like he's one of the people that made me want to get in this business. Cause I yeah. like, all right, reading a review of two cars I, or three that I couldn't genuinely couldn't give a shit about. Yeah. And then it's he's, just like the f five way all wheel drive minivan comparison test that he did, which is online. Uh, and they go to like the Dalton highway in Alaska and it's like the Ford Astro four wheel drive and the Mazda MPB MPV four wheel drive. Like, and I just remember reading it aloud and just laughing uproariously while I was on a road trip. Like he really got the idea that this was edutainment, right? Yes. Like I do want a, a review of those minivans and I want to know which one's best, mm -hmm. but please by God, make me laugh the entire time. Um, of the Bugatti EB 110. Exuding all the charm of an industrial air conditioner, it nonetheless will remain rare because no one will want one, no one can afford to maintain one, and the company's likely swan dive into receivership won't need, leave enough cash to buy an industrial air conditioner. That's harsh. Yes. Like a, you know, likely swan dive into receivership. Oof. Which was true. Mm -hmm. uh, of the Bugatti Veyron, it won't enhance your sex life because it causes all of the blood to rush to your head. Cheap. Cheap comedy on that one. He could have done better. Of the GMC Typhoon, less a typhoon than a tsunami of hurry-up engineering guaranteed to leave in its wake a tidal wave of shrapneled valves, rods, cam lobes, and neighbors who finally feel it's safe to let their kids out again. <laughs> <laughs> that was unnecessarily harsh, but extremely comedic. I mean, but, and also Because that was quite durable, right? I mean, no 80s turbocharged anything was, was durable. Really? Are those things known for grenading? I mean, I've seen a couple with bad with blown motors, but I don't know. I, everything '80s in turbocharged just didn't have the engine. Yeah, you didn't have the ability to control fuel and thus yeah. temperature. Yeah, but I love or that boost. the typhoon. He also brought in the imagery of typhoon, tsunami, and tidal wave. Mm -hmm. Like it's clever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of the Daewoo Nubira, like a George Foreman grill, but greasier. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, of a Caterham 7, like driving a rural... Oh, God. Do you know that Do you know that rural juror? Do you know what a rural juror is? Please tell me you guys on the internet are old enough to have watched 30 Rock and watched Jenna Monroney try to say rural juror. Oh. Um, but I have to say rural root mailbox. Okay, like uh, Caterham 7, like driving a rural root mailbox into which vandals occasionally toss lit cherry bombs <laughs> that first step in and then somehow <laughs> induce pneumonia. 
<laughs> Again, oddly specific. Off his, me- off his meds, for sure. <laughs> into which a a rural vandals- mailbox. Like dry- driving a rural route mailbox into which vandals occasionally toss lit cherry bombs that first deafen and then somehow induce pneumonia. Like, okay, I understand. So I'm guessing car it's a rattle you, trap. Yeah. And it assaults you. But what the fuck is the you know, pneumonia? I guess fumes. Hmm. I don't know. Unclear. Of the Dodge Shadow. Who would have thought that someone could create a car guaranteed to make your wife shout, wow, my mother was right. (laughs) (laughs) That's so good. (laughs) He did. What in the fuck? There was something else I was reading. Oh my God. Where he did this whole thing about, oh, some chick went, he tried to, oh, his BMW 850. I think it was an 850 that he took. He went took some chick to like uh, out on a date on for New Year's to Canada or something in this 850, and she wound up going home with a guy who was in a Corrado. So he gave the car a bad review. <laughs> he was like, oh. um, of a Ford Bronco. It's like a morbidly obese NFL defensive lineman with 14 concussions and 12 knee operations in his 42nd birthday, a week off. Oh Jesus Christ! All right, hold on. This has got to be the big Bronco. No, yeah, I fucked this one up. This is the OJ a, Bronco. Yeah, this is the OJ Bronco and his 42nd birthday. So 40, a week off. So 41.9 year So not very athletic. Old. Yes. Not Former athletic, athletic person. Uh-huh. Um, of the Factory 5 Roadster. In the rain, it exhibited this all This is, the, by the way, a like rep, a Cobra copy or something like that. Factory 5 was a Cobra, yeah. I remember back in the day, they got a lot of coverage in car driver. Uh, in the rain, it exhibited all the poise of a Zamboni on the Rubicon Trail. <laughs> 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 that that is just so oddly specific. heavy on imagery yeah right it's just vivid i mean it's incredibly vivid sort of the thing that made clarkson clarkson right clarkson would be like you know he would just say the sort of comparative things that he would say were always amazing or you know there's a b on my epiglottis you know little things like using words that we wouldn't use yes um in normal speech but yeah the all the poise of a zamboni on the rubicon trail you want to say something that's got no ground clearance you just i can't think of a better way sorry what was that one about again the factory five roadster uh-huh. um of the mercor xr4 ti oh that should be quite good it looks like isn't. it looks like a geothermal event <laughs> bulging up through the tarmac <laughs> That's obviously a reaction to the aerodynamic styling yeah. that uh, was obviously too new too, for yeah. Phillips's mind in the 80s. A geothermal event. <laughs> I've never heard anyone call a car a geothermal event. Uh-oh. <laughs> of an early Maserati Quattroporte. Which generation? QP5? It just says early Maserati Quattroporte, so my guess is three. Mm. That's not early. Early would be the one. <laughs> well, I think we just figured it out. I think it's three. The dash and its attendant control layout resemble a trailer park following an Oklahoma tornado. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise known as, I think at some point, somebody, I might have been me, said it looks like a bunch of engineers had a mouthful of buttons and sneezed. Yeah. I, I don't remember. I remember that one. Of the Daihatsu Rocky. Oh, yeah. I do. Uh, One of the few cars apparently capable of simultaneously summoning dive, squat, yaw, understeer, oversteer, a trade deficit, acid (laughs) reflux, impotence, and a military coup in Ecuador. (laughs) The Derek That's the best one. Um, That's the best one so far. That's great. Understeer, oversteer, trade deficit. Yeah. I mean, I just, it just gets progressively more insane. Um, Of the cockpit smell in a Hyundai Pony. A curious mixture of wet dog, WD-40, and liquid Maalox. <laughs> um, and that's it. And there's somehow no comments on car and driver's uh, that. Um, yeah. Well, go make a thousand comments, I guess. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. Phillips is, uh, he was so funny. Is so funny. I mean, he's still occasionally writing, I think. Excellent. I mean, he's still around. I'm so delighted. Um, my, I, there are so many things that I remember from my childhood, like individual quotes, like car and driver reviewing the geo storm. And they said it, cause I think that was a 7,500 RPM, 16 valve. It was like a 7,000 RPM. It was a big, it was a high revving motor. And I, the, I remember laughing out loud at the line that it revs like an Osterizer and whips up a hundred and whatever, 16 horsepower. And that was so great. Like, all right, mm-hmm. revs like an Osterizer and then whips up horsepower. Great imagery. Or the, 
Art Saint Antoine uh, line on the E thirty three twenty five I. If I could sing like the engine in the new BMW three twenty five I, I would pack the pack the hall the Carnegie Hall night after night. <laughs> like I just always love these sort of like out of nowhere imagery that just really make you stop and go. He thought about that. Mm-hmm. He spent some time on that. And it uh, tells you something yeah. without explicitly. T- it shows you in writing, right? You normally you try to show rather than tell, right. and that's a little bit difficult to do in writing. But when you do manage to do it in writing through yeah. good sort of comparative simile or metaphor, it's uh, something to. It's tough to do. I'm sure it comes natural to some people. It's tough to yes. do for for me when I'm writing, trying to think of funny comparisons, and uh, it just doesn't. I try to put at least one weird one in every episode that I do. Shocker. Yeah. I know. A, a turn of a turn of phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful device as shown there. At, and it can be obviously used for good or for not. Right. It's, good. Well, it's a really great device. It's great writing. It's great. It's great entertainment when it's a positive thing, but it's a really great way of softening the blow. I mean, if I was an engineer who worked on that factory five road, sir, I would, I, it wouldn't matter how offended I was at what it, <laughs> that imagery is so fucking absurd that yes. um yeah it's a it's a tough thing to shit all over someone else's work well they shouldn't have made it shitty well what are they going to say about our episode just now <laughs> we shouldn't have made it shitty made, damn it <laughs> oh there we go um okay, well. I'm glad we got to talk about Phillips He's yeah, a, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Carmudgeon Show. I'm not really sure what it was about, but hopefully you had some amusement because certainly we did. <laughs> okay, hold on. We'll f- we'll come up with a conclusion. It, this episode was as focused as uh, something about Coke bottles. <laughs> you know, Coke bottle glasses yeah, yeah, or someone yeah. who's spectacles. See, this is it's it's tough to do, especially on the spot. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's not my forte. All right. Well. This episode was deeply unfocused. How about that? Yes. I mean, maybe the cameras were in focus, but maybe not. Depends on how Jake was Sort of blurry vision. Yeah. Yes. Sort of blurry vision's back. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.